Recording is on. So I saw your PR come through, Jesse. It looks like yep. you've done some uh, editor work, I believe, with some of the JSON editing stuff. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that you finished that thing I showed last time. Great. Um, yeah, it looked great. And then you were actually were going in and you were doing some uh, Go updates as well. I, I noticed you were updating mm -hmm. some some structs and some other things in there. So yeah, how was that process? Was it, I, I know you're not classically a Go developer. Was it easy enough yeah. to pick up? Um, I was just adding, adding a setting to the side, side configuration. So it was a lot of places that I had to add it to, but yeah, it's, it was pretty straightforward. The syntax was yep. clear. I think. Yeah, you were able to, without any help, you were able to find the places where you needed to do it, yep. it looks like, which is uh, awesome. Um, I mean, Go in general is, is, you know, it's all procedural, so it's usually can kind of follow it along, but, um, you know, plenty has grown and, and it, obviously at some point we need some refactoring and some tests and stuff in there. So it's cool that even though in the current state, it's a little, you know, all over the place, it's cool that you were able to figure out and, and get that stuff in there. So that's awesome. Um, do you want to share your screen and and walk me through some of these changes? Maybe we could take a look at both what it looks like on the front end and then um, uh, some of the code and, and just make sure there's understanding there. I haven't had a ton of chance to, to dive through it myself. I merged it in there um, just because I, I briefly looked at the PR. It looked fine. It looked like everything you were doing there made sense, but I haven't actually had a chance to take it down locally and test it. So um, it'd be great if you want to show me what's going on and, and explain it to me. That'd be yeah, awesome. I can. Um, oh, I have to turn off the other screen again. Uh, okay. Can you see the screen? I can. Yeah. Yep. I see your VS Code editor. Yeah, I have the commits of the master branch right here. Awesome. So I have put in everything you had in the plenty plenty co plenty repository. Mm -hmm. So there's my there's the pull request merge. Okay. And here's all the commits I have made. To awesome. it. Um, so this was these were the same commits we went through last time. Okay. Except, uh, I added some feedback for the publishing mm -hmm. thing. So it says it's committing and says it if it's successful and or is it's not. And I added exception. Um, I, I can show the, you the code actually. Sure. So here's a sta state for sending, sent and failed, and just sets them accordingly. Okay. Uh, Are you so able to bump up your screen just like yeah. one side? Awesome. Thank you. I know it's hard to fit everything on there when it gets too big, but yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> Okay, so that's so now the sending here. This is talking about sending the commit back to the GitLab repository. Yeah, is that correct? It okay? Is. And if it's successful, it says send send through, mm -hmm. or it, if it fails, get some error, then it mm -hmm. sets fail through. Okay. And it shows the according message right beside the publish button. Okay. Great. And disables that when it's sending. The comment. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then I, I noticed also when I was kind of breezing through the PR that you added to the configuration file um, the branch. So it looked yeah. like that's kind of important for this process. Okay. Yeah. So I'm... yeah, and I will go to that. Okay. It's the last 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 commit. Okay. But, cool. Um, yeah, I had to add, add exception for the index file because it's not in collection folders mm. it's just in the content route if mm -hmm, we go mm -hmm. to the, where is it default yes. yep. uh, starters learner yep. content there's the index yep. file at the root yeah yeah index file is kind of weird right because it, mm. it's the it's the one so normally files we you know we take the file name but the index file we kind of just like you know, do some weird stuff with it. So that one's always an interesting case. 
Um, so yeah, I, I'm curious. Um, it's a special case. Yeah. And the thing is, I'm, I wonder, so there's this concept in, in plenty. Um, so everything is we were calling like content types or types for short. Um, so for instance, in that learner right there, in that content folder, there's blogs, pages, and index. All three of those are different types, right? So each one of those gets routed inside like the layouts content folder. And you can have this concept of a normal type, which is blog and pages, where there's many pages that get the same template starter. And then there's single types like index, but their index doesn't have to be the only one like that. Like if you have a mm. one-off page, like such as um, maybe you want your, your page that aggregates all the blog posts, it's not necessarily a blog post itself. So you might create like a, a single content type called like blog page or, or, you know, blog landing page or whatever. And that's a yeah. single type. So I'm curious, do you think that that will have to be accounted for in a special case or? Yeah, I, I didn't think there was other single types. Yeah. So does they also go to the root of the content folder? Yeah, they would. So, yep, oh, exactly. Okay. So, so again, these are things that we can address as they come up and as, as we get in deeper. Um, but I guess yeah, they are that's... defined somewhere in here. Yeah, so you can define, yeah, so exactly. You can actually, yeah, exactly. See how we're kind of overriding the index there with the pagination? Like you could override any of the single types just like you override um, the, the multi-types. Um, yeah. Um, but that would, should, should, uh, I should fix that sometimes. So sure. that yeah. it also took account the other single types. Yeah. It's something that we yeah. can address at some point. Um, yeah. yeah. Currently only indexes for that. Sure, sure. And then there's the commit for adding a specifying branch inside configuration. So mm -hmm. when publishing to a send, pressing the publish button, it sends commit commits to a, a branch, but that branch has to be specified in, in where to commit. So it was later, it was uh, previously, it was uh, hard coded, so I moved it to the site configuration so it can be changed. Mm -hmm. Great. So I, here I added to the default learner skeleton or template yep. uh, the default branch that is uh, its main. Mm -hmm. it, I okay. guess it's the most preferred. Type, although I make no assumptions. Yeah, yeah. It seems like GitLab and, and GitHub are both moving that direction. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. GitLab has default of main and GitHub also. I think. Yeah, it's only confused by the fact Git, that Git still starts with master. Yeah. yeah. Git actually does it specify any defaults? Oh, interesting. I think it doesn't even specify defaults. You have to say it. Say it that it it suggests main, but it doesn't specify that it has to be. You have oh, to type it, type it um, to confirm that you want to add it as default. Yeah, I'm just thinking like, and maybe this is my version of of Git or a configuration I have from previous but when i when i get yeah. in it things it still initializes to the master branch so i don't know yeah, that I, yeah. It, it gets it from the configuration global configuration that you have uh -huh. okay all right i can just update that then but i think they went to the route that they don't specify the mm, okay. branch. oh that makes sense okay yeah. cool and then i added the branch to the other structure and, mm -hmm. and uh, everywhere else that it needed to be, like this yep. uh, a string that is gener generated for the so match prop. Yep. Yeah. I've been yep. thinking about, I mean, I've been thinking about this environment stuff. Uh, a little bit again, you know, plenty is still in the zero X phase so we can break mm -hmm. APIs and stuff. Um, uh, one of our theme designers, Roberto, I don't know if you've seen some of his work 
come through, but he's, mm. you know, doing some stuff um, where he needs environment variables and we don't have a great way to do it. I'm thinking like, okay, maybe there should be an easy way in the plenty.json configuration file to specify your own environment variables that you can use locally and then, you know, get replaced yeah. either in your CI or hosting by whatever uh, system you're using there. And I'm thinking we probably should create a better way to do that. And I'm wondering if mm. the ENV magic prop should be, you know, used for that because it seems like the most standard way to do something like that. So I don't know. It's something I, I need to think yeah. through at some point. I want to make sure that it actually works before I do a thing too rash. But um, I, yeah, I think but you... does every like environment variable type of variables uh, end up in the front end? If there are some secrets that have have to be in the back end. Exactly. And that's what I need to think through. And I guess it's a little off topic for here, but it's, yeah. so how can, how can we have like the replacement happen? Right. So, so like, um, I'm thinking, mm. you know, in your app, you're actually typing in like the environment variable and, you know, somehow when you're developing locally, you're getting that from a local configuration file that's not tracked with Git, but then when it's deployed, it's being replaced by, you know, a, a Netlify variable or, or whatever hosting solution you have. It's actually being replaced there. So you're never actually putting that in the client. Um, but yeah, it, it, that's, yeah, these are challenging problems that we have to think through at some point. And I think hmm. all Jamstack sites have this kind of challenge. Yeah. But I think so. Again, yeah, not something we have to solve right now, but. Mm. But that's about it. I could show you a demo of how it works. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I have already, you haven't created tag for it, so it, probably hasn't gone through the package manager so yep yeah unfortunately you have to use your if you've yeah. built locally you have to use that one <laughs> yeah i have um, already built this version so great. i could just start start it here this is the this is my testing site for the mm -hmm. cms um actually it, it's not the correct one um Plenty CMS test. I have a bunch of this. <laughs> yes, yeah, me too. I, I lose track of them all the time. I'm like, which one is this? <laughs> yeah. I will just commit the branch branch mm -hmm. setting here. Sure. Um, branch. Thing. Yeah, so now I will use the server command mm -hmm. to pull it and serve it. Great. To localhost. And it should open here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have already done some testing here. Uh, nice. <laughs> nice. CMS was here. Yeah. And we could try the index file. So now if you are logged in, there's this editor, mm -hmm. as we discussed in the yeah. previous meeting. Um, so it hasn't changed. changed all, all it's changed is the feedback text that comes uh, yep. to the right side of the publish button mm -hmm. so if we add like test paragraph hit publish it says sending and change committed great although you have to still because this is local and there is no web hooks or anything you have you to pull it again pull yeah. it yeah uh-huh can, so can you pull it so i can see what that if that commit like looks like I, i'm just curious yeah And just so people who are watching, if they're confused what's happening here is, so this is connected to a remote repository on GitLab. It's writing directly from the browser to that repository. And since we're hosting this locally and not using this off of a hosted version, we're not seeing that change happen in real time, even though it could kick off CI or whatever you want in the background. So we're just, we're doing that manually right here. I think that's apparent for people, but. Yeah. So, so yeah. here's the commit. Okay. It just always, always has currently update content. Message. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. 
but it has it has you as the the committing user yeah. which is great because it's tied to your gitlab username um the, yeah the logged in user is is the committer yeah no that's great that looks awesome and when we go back here it's there that's sweet um yeah, yeah that's really cool so i on a side note, I mean, kind of related to this is I've been having um, an issue with GitLab that uh, with their CI runner. So basically, and I, mm -hmm. there's there's like several issues that are open in GitLab related to this and I actually saw some activity on it this morning. So hopefully this will be something that's fixed in the near future. But what's happening is the way that we're building the default container for plenty right now. So basically every time we release a new tag in, in GitHub, it does a build, you know, so it builds all the, the binaries and everything. And then mm -hmm. we actually build a, a public container that gets hosted on Docker Hub. And that container is built from what's called scratch. And that's a way to build a container without any dependencies whatsoever besides the binary on it. Now, oh. a, scratch con a scratch container doesn't have anything. It literally doesn't even have a shell on it. Uh, so you mm. can't SSH into it. You can't, you, you know, you can't, not that you SSH into it, but you, you can't attach to it and like run shell commands. It doesn't have that. All it has is the binary. And the way you typically would, would run a container that is just a binary is you would run it from its entry point. So Docker has this concept of entry point. And basically what you do is you set the entry point to the binary, and then you could basically just like run the container. And that's like a pretty standard way to do Docker stuff. However, the way that GitLab is set up with its runners is it actually wants everything to be run as a script, right? So you specify... A container and then it wants you to run a script on that container which with a scratch container you can't do now we have a couple options one is wait for gitlab to update this so you can just run containers without a shell so right now you have to run a script like it, it's forced on every one of the steps you have to run a script they're talking about removing that step it seems like the developers and the maintainers are in agreement that we should remove that at some point so i think the future is we will be able to run these scratch containers in the meantime what I can do is I can run an Alpine container. So Alpine is also a very small starting point for a Docker container, but it actually has a shell on it. So it increases the size of our containers. Obviously, we want to keep our containers small and fast because this whole thing works on a fast feedback loop, right? So the faster this whole thing works, the better that content editing experience is. But for now, as a stopgap, what I think I'm going to do is, now that I've pulled in your changes, Jesse, I'm probably going to add another build step to our um, our release cycle. So we use a project called Go Releaser to actually release you know the different binaries and everything. So I'll probably add another step to build a second container that's like called Plenty Alpine or something along those lines so we can actually build in GitLab. Because right now, if you go to like the Plenty documentation, it has a GitLab dot, you know, uh, a dot GitLab CI YAML file that, as an example, but that won't actually work because of this issue. So I just want to throw that out there in case people are trying this out or if you've been running into this yourself. Um, yeah, you're going to get some issues. That's really tested. It, with the build process. Yeah, is, is it breaking? I haven't, I haven't tested. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, but is the problem that you cannot uh, run shell scripts or yeah. you could run some JavaScript script or some Python script if you install Python to the container? Yeah, so that's the thing. So we could, yeah. And that, I'm actually wondering if that's a way we could do it too. Like you could, yeah set up the environment to have a bigger container and then just run plenty as its own container inside that. But yeah, yeah, right right now I was trying to get it to work. So it's just that simple, small container without a shell and it just won't work with that the way it's set up right now. So, okay. um, so yeah, if you do try to, if you look at like the plenty documentation and you look at the very, you know, there's like a GitLab runner documentation that right now is broken. I have an issue in the, our GitHub repository that explains this a little bit, but, um, I think in the meantime, I'm going to release an Alpine container so you can run that. Um, mm. Again, like if you're doing more complex things, like you're pulling in your own NPM modules, then again, we're going to have to rethink that again. But uh, for now, I'll get something working uh, in the meantime, just so you, you can build some stuff and start testing this remotely. Because I think it'd be cool so you can actually see that, you know, that feedback loop um, without having to get pulled. That'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. So, and how fast I'm it is. What's that? And we should test how fast it is. So because that was one of the priorities. Yeah, priorities exactly. And that, goals. Yeah, that and that kind of fits into the ultimate vision, right? So there's, yeah. I think, you know, we can get it. I'm hoping that we can get this reasonably fast, but I think there's going to be a couple sticking points, right? So one is, is 
without having a dedicated environment that is meant to just run these containers really fast, like is, is GitLab runners going to be fast enough for us? Because I think it's really set up to do like automated code testing and all sorts of deployment things. I'm not sure it's meant for real-time CMS. So I'm thinking like, do we actually, you know, set up a purpose-built way to host these things eventually, right? So um, there's a, you know, there's a project called Gogs and Git T. I don't know if you've heard those. They're, they're like Go-based kind of like GitHub clones. And then there's another project called Woodpecker CI, which is based on Drone, which is a, a Go-based um, continuous integration uh, platform. And I'm wondering if we could create a purpose, again, these are long-term visions, a, a purpose-built platform to actually make this process super fast for people who need dedicated builds onto this kind of thing. I mean, that's something that could be ultimately turned into a service offering. But again, I, I want to make a good product before we start thinking about service offerings, to, to be honest. Um, yep. But that that's one way we could approach this. Uh, again, keeping the containers super small, so building from scratch would ultimately be good. Uh, I think we could actually make our binaries even smaller. Again, that comes to refactoring. And then the real bottleneck is ultimately, how do we do this compilation step faster? Right now, we're doing the whole pull the, the Svelte project into V8. Um, at the very least, we probably want to slim down the stuff that we're using in Svelte and then running it in a much more efficient way in V8. And ultimately, if we can do it in something like Goja or a native Go way to run it, I think we can make some uh, more improvements there. Um, and of course, anything that we can pull into Go itself in terms of the build stuff, I think that would improve things. So those are all long-term goals. I think you know, the first step is get the project working in some sort of way so people can demo it and understand what we're doing here. Because I still think there's a lot of confusion around what we're actually building. Uh, so, so getting this into people's hands and getting them to understand like what the concept is, is step number one. And then once they kind of feel the power of this approach where you can have a full editing website without a server and it's super easy and cheap to host and all those different things. Um, once we, we, we have communicated that vision and people understand it, then I think we work on the big improvements of making it like a, a real time system. That's fast. At least that's how I'm, I'm thinking about approaching it. Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes sense. Do we need, need the screen share anymore? No, I don't think so. Want me to turn this off?